everyone, and welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Camilla Claghorn. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at Panorama. Now, this is a darling little game that caught my eye back at Essen in 2022, and by that I mean it truly just caught my eye. It is absolutely a striking cover. It's going to be a drafting game, kind of semi-co-op, where you're working with the players on your left and your right, but ultimately, you want the most points at the end of the game to win. You want the most prolific or beautiful panorama, if you will. So let's check out how it plays. Panorama is designed by Alex Winter. It's going to be a game for one to six players playing in about 20 minutes, and the box recommends ages eight plus. In Panorama, you are simultaneously going to be drafting cards in order to build out two panoramas, one to your left and one to your right. At the end of the game, you will score both of these panoramas, even though you are building them with players to your left and your right. So they are shared panoramas. It's going to be played over two different phases. With the first one, you will go through the dusk phase, and in the second one, you will go through the dawn phase. Let's go ahead and set the dawn aside for now. As, as it does play very similar. You also have different goals that'll be out, four per game, so we'll go ahead and reveal a couple of those. Depending on player count, everyone's going to receive some cards. In a three-player game, you get 12 cards, so you'll go ahead and deal 12 of those to every player. Like I said before, this is a drafting game, so everyone will look at their hand of cards and simultaneously choose one to play out into one of their two panoramas, either on the right or the left. And again, you are sharing these with the people on your right and your left. So you choose one to play, play, pass your hand of cards, and get the next hand of cards. Again, you would choose one of these to play either in, a, in attachment to the one that you've already played, or in this case, maybe I would start my left one as well, unless the other player has done so. I'm going to pull this panorama over here just so that we can talk about the placement rules. You'll notice on these cards there's different heights on the left and the right. This one is low, this one is high. And so looking at a card, you always have to make sure that that landscape matches. For example, this could not be placed here because this is a high card with a low. Doesn't make sense, right? In the same way, it could not be placed on this side. However, let's find one that would work here. For example, this moose could go next to the fox here because those landscapes do match and then this one could be placed over here. If for some reason, when you get your hand of cards, you cannot place any of them on either side of your left or your right panorama, then you have to put one face down, and that acts as a wild or a reset. You'll notice it has no type, um, but it does reset the landscape and matches all of the different sides. Each card is going to have a type, as I alluded to there a second ago. For example, this one is a moose card. Uh, here we have a bear card, but you'll see they're in orange, meaning they're all animal cards. Over here, a green, this is more of a landscape card. It has the Aurora Borealis in it. And that's going to be important because it is going to how you it's going to tell you how you're going to score those cards. So let's go ahead and fast forward here. I'll show you one of the completed panoramas and talk about the scoring. Here, for example, we have a 10-card panorama, which is what you would have in a four-player game. You'll notice, again, the symbols at the bottom, and you just go through and count the points based on your ability to fulfill those requirements. For example, here, the Aurora Borealis one, it is for pairs. So that would be three points right here for the pair. The moon is its own points, that would be two. This card offers no points, but it is a type, and you'll see that will go into this cliff. The cliff actually costs you two points if it is next to, on the left, an animal card. So that would be negative two points. On the right, however, it does want another landscape tile, which it has here, so that would be plus three points. And you keep going until you score all of the panorama. You will have one, two panoramas, one on your right, one on your left, from this uh, dusk phase here, and then you will have two panoramas, one from your right, one from your left, during the dawn phase. Players will also go through and attribute any of the points here from these, the, from the goal tiles, for example, the single panorama that has the most foxes will gain those two players who contributed to it five points. Uh, the longest panorama, shortest panorama, foxes, there's lots of different ones in here that come in the game. Add up all those points together, highest points wins. 
right off the bat, I want to talk about just what a lovely production this game is. Like I said in the, in the intro there, that's what kind of caught my eye. It's what led me to buy the game and bring it back all the way to Essen just to try it, is the aesthetics of this. But I will say that doesn't stop just at the box and the picture on the box. All of the production is very nice. It has great linen finished cards, uh, the consistent coloring through them, but also kind of unique artwork through it. It has a really good uh, overview where you can see the panorama, but does a good job of giving you little bitty insights on that or little bitty shout outs to it. I mean, each of the Aurora Borealis cards are different and I really appreciate that. I think that you see it all come together, but see the uniqueness of these individual little snapshots as well. So all in all, this is just an absolutely lovely production. I didn't have any problems um, punching it out. The cards fit nicely in the box. It's got a good insert to it as well. The, the magnetic box holds really well. It's just a, an absolutely lovely production, not just in the box artwork. So that was a really good positive to see that consistently through it. Um, but I want to talk about the box stats for a second here because that is something that kind of uh, threw me. It says it's for one to six players, but I think it's really important to note here that it's a one and a two player variant. Because you are working Again, semi-cooperatively with the players on your left and your right, you can kind of see how that would, would fall apart at two players or even solo, right? Especially two players. The player on your right is the same as the one on your left. So it has a variant in here. And I really wish they had put that on the box. Uh, that's just something that's really been bothering me lately. And, and especially in a game like this, not knowing what kind of game I was going into, I don't know that I would have bought it as a two-player game, whereas that's mainly what I'm playing these days. Um, but that being said, it, it the variant works fine. I don't think I have any interest in playing this in less than three. I think that as the game is designed, it is best at probably four or even five. Six, you can kind of get into AP. So let's talk about that for a second here. This is a game of a lot of decisions. So back again to those box stats, it's saying it's for eight plus. Um, mechanism wise, an eight year old can absolutely understand this. You have a deck of cards. This one can fit with this one. You can play on your left or right. You understand how to play the game. But do you understand how to win the game? Can you really put together and weigh all those options? I don't think so. And in a three player game, for example, where you have 12 cards in your hand, that very first placement can take upwards of two minutes. So can the second and the third. It does get less and less as it goes as you have less decisions to kind of mull over, but you're also kind of keeping an eye on what other people are doing. Um, all right, they might have the most boxes. I still have less over here, but maybe, you know what, I'm gonna push my luck a little bit. You have a lot going on. So it can definitely lead to AP because of the high symbology of this, because of the decisions and as well as, you are building two panoramas at one time. As well as if you're in that second phase of the game, if you are in that dawn phase, so you're, you're, you're building your third and your fourth panorama, you're also trying to remember back what you did before and kind of competing with yourself. So it can definitely lead to some AP moments. And I have concerns about those young, that younger crowd, that eight to maybe even 12, um, being able to be competitive in this game. Speaking of being competitive, I also have um, concerns about the, not the replayability, but I guess the long-term strategy and that strategy holding up. In uh, multiple plays of this, the person who won is the one who balanced best their panoramas that had very similar scores on their left and their right. And I do worry if that's kind of the strategy, you know, is really just kind of maintaining that balance between the two um, to, to really hone in on a single single score or a really close score between those two. So, so I do wonder about that long-term strategy, if that is going to not have balance issue, but if the strategy is just to balance and it's who balances the best between the two panoramas. Uh, if you know you have one neighbor who's not pulling their weight on there, can you really win? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've, in my plays, it's been no. Um, and I've had quite a few plays of this. So, so that being said, as far as um, the other thing, I do find sometimes that the symbology is not really clear. I wish the rule book was a little clearer as well. Um, there was times that it does come with one player aid card. So first of all, that's an abomination. You need multiple of these to understand the symbology. Um, just they need, they got passed around the table constantly. 
But then in the rule book is the exact same wording as on the player aid, which is just one little card. And sometimes I just felt like it needed a little more explanation. We eventually figured it out, but it just took a little bit too much discussion to kind of come to that, especially in game where you're looking at a card and you're trying to weigh your options. It's just one more thing that kind of slogs the game down. That being said, I do want to uh, speak to some of the positives of the game. Again, it's absolutely lovely and there are, it does really lead to some interesting decisions. If you can let go of that AP and having this hand of cards, and I do enjoy the balance in that personal decision space of not only, well, first of all, what can I play? You know, second of all, what do I want to play? I know my left one I'm kind of ignoring right now, but I'm going for this watchtower strategy. My right one is the mountain strategy, but my partner's really not picking up on that. So I'm going to throw some points over there also to, you know, put a moon out there or a sun if you're in the dawn phase, something like that. So I really think that it adds or it brings to the table some really good decision space. Unfortunately, that decision space just sometimes gets a little sloggy. Um, and so I really like that semi co-op nature where it's, it d definitely feels like a frenemies kind of situation. It's not, I'm not cooperating with you, but I'm making you help, letting you help me towards my ultimate victory. And I do think that that worked really well in this game. Uh, it is interesting also in the higher player count games where you are having to watch what's happening on the other side of the table, but you can't do anything about it. And that's really interesting as well. I think one of my favorite rules in this game though, is if you can play a card, you have to. You do have that wild that you can turn upside down or that neutral card that'll interrupt your scoring. It doesn't do anything for scoring, but um, you can play it upside down only if you have no legal placement. And I think that really puts a good pressure on the game. I think if you could just willy nilly put those down, uh, you know, and just, just hate draft a little bit, then that wouldn't be nearly as interesting. So that is probably my favorite rule in that. I think that in this game, I think that that really adds a lot of pressure to the decision as well as a lot of tension. Like, oh, I want both of these cards. I hope it comes back around, but I'm a big fan of drafting games as well. So, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and final thoughts here. I'm going to come in as six on this game. It's one that I think, unfortunately, the actual look and production carries a lot of that score. It definitely feels like a passion, you know, and me having a passion for the outdoors and really being, again, I've said it before, kind of that shallow gamer. Uh, this one really sang for me in that realm. I do have a struggle with AP. I do think that it does kind of slog down with players. It, it slogs down at higher player counts, which is also where it shines. And so for me, that definitely pulls it down. It's not one that I would recommend very often, but it's one that in the right mood or feeling a little bit nostalgic or wanting a little bit of fresh air or something like that, I would happily pull this out. And, um, to certain people maybe recommend, but as a general rule, it's not one that I'm, I'm going to recommend. So for me, that is going to be a six, taking a look at Panorama. Thanks for stopping by.